Good afternoon and welcome to today's Regulatory Transparency Project webinar, Grading the Biden DOL and NLRB's Use of Regulatory Authorities. We are glad that you are here. My name is Steve Schaefer and I'm the director of the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project. We are pleased to have with us a stellar panel of experts. Note, as always, the opinions expressed are those of the experts. In order to get right to the discussion, I will keep our impressive panel's introduction short. Please find out more about our experts at fedtalk.org. That is fedtalk.org. First, we are pleased to have with us Judy Conti. Judy is the Director of Government Affairs for the National Employment Law Project. She previously spent seven years as the co-founder and executive director of the DC Employment Justice Center. Second, we are happy to have with us uh, Philip Miscamara. Phil is a partner at Morgan & Lewis. Phil leads the firm's NLRB special appeals practice and is co-leader of Morgan Lewis Workface, Workforce Change. Um, Philip is also the former chairman of the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, we are pleased to have with us Timothy Taylor. Tim is an employment litigation partner with Holland and Knight LLP. Before rejoining Holland and Knight, uh, Tim served as deputy solicitor of labor. Our moderator today is Gregory Jacob. Greg is a partner in labor and employment litigation at Old Mulvaney and Myers LLP. Previously, Greg served as counsel to Vice President Pence and deputy assistant to the president. Greg, over to you. Well, I am incredibly excited to get to be part of this panel uh, and to moderate it today uh, with these distinguished experts. I think it's fair to say that the Department of Labor and the NLRB have been on the cutting edge of uh, regulatory and administrative issues for decades, uh, and particularly have been in the midst of a number of hot button issues for the last several years. And those are the issues that our panel is going to get a chance to dig into today. Um, the EEOC is also an interesting agency, um, and it's possible uh, that it might be referred to during the course of today, but we're keeping the focus on DOL and NLRB because the EEOC got a bit of a late start uh, during the Biden administration due to personnel turnover uh, issues. You have to get everybody confirmed in order to get things moving along. So just to set the table uh, for today's discussion, uh, Phil, I'm going to ask you first, uh, and then we'll go to the other panelists, but what do you consider to be the most significant rulemakings or regulatory actions taken by your old haunt, the NLRB, during the Biden administration? Well, there's a lot, and I will start out by saying, you know, an employment agency like the NLRB, uh, it, it tends to function as a delivery system for rights and protection. And I tend to think of agency effectiveness through two different measures. Uh, one is what I might call a uh, regulatory process grade. I think this is the most important. It's kind of a chaos versus clarity index. And setting aside specific policies, the question is whether the agency is advancing the goal of helping people understand the most important thing that everyone needs to know. Basically, what's the difference between what's prohibited and what's required? Uh, the second uh, measure, I think, is a policy judgment grade. And this might be less important, but that, that basically deals with the question of, do you think the way I think? Um, and um, I'll save my assessment of those measures for later. But when you talk about the Biden NLRB and the NLRB general counsel, uh, Jennifer Baruso, uh, in the past three years, they've done a lot and they have made significant changes in multiple directions. Uh, in a case called Miller Plastic, the board uh, expanded the scope of protected activity. Uh, in a case called Lion Elastomers, the board provided special protection for sexually or racially offensive statements or conduct that arise in a context that involves union issues. Um, the board has attempted to redefine the definition of employer, uh, which involves an expansive standard governing joint employer status in new regulations, which have uh, uh, recently been overturned by a federal district court uh, in Texas. In a case called Atlanta Opera, the NLRB modified the definition of employee by narrowing who could be considered an independent contractor. Uh, in a case called uh, Semex Construction, the board overhauled the standard governing when and how union elections work and how unions 
can seek or demand recognition. And the new standards in many circumstances eliminate employee voting and secret ballot elections. And the last point that I'll mention is the NLRB general counsel has taken the position in a significant number of cases that um, employer workplace discussions about unions or the exercise of protected activity in other contexts is per se unlawful and inherently coercive, even if nothing is communicated that is coercive or threatening or improper. And so that's a non-exhaustive list, but just to click through the subjects that I've uh, mentioned, uh, they are important subjects and the changes are significant. So the board has been busy. It had kind of a slow start in President Biden's uh, first year in office, but there's been a lot coming out of the agency and it has been eventful and significant. Thanks, Phil. Um, so Judy, you, from your perch, uh, you sort of span the universe of both NLRB and DOL in terms of the issues that you're handling on a daily basis. Uh, from your perspective, what have been the most significant rulemakings and regulatory actions at both of those agencies? Sure, uh, happy to be here today. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'll start by saying that, you know, I come at this from a point of view of looking at the balance of power between workers and employers. And my perspective is that, you know, over the past number of decades, four or five of them, um, the balance has really shifted to an inappropriate amount of power in the hands of employers and far too little in the hands of workers. Now, it's it's the natural course of things. I, I know for employers to inherently have more power in so many circumstances because they are the ones that have the jobs, that that hold the capital of the, the enterprise, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, uh, my point of view is that Regulations and law need to balance the power between employers and workers in, in, a, in a better and a more fair sense to compensate for market failures, if you will. Um, and when we look at that, um, the things that NELP is paying the most attention to are the regulations that work to help rebalance that power, give workers more control over the manner in which they work, who they can negotiate with, whether or not they can choose a union, uh, how they're paid, how they're classified, all, all of the hot button issues, right? So for the board, um, you know, we were really thrilled to see the representation rules. Um, elections just drag on far too long. Employers have a lot of power to make them drag on longer. Uh, and the longer they take, the, the harder it is for workers to um, continue to exercise their will to want to unionize. Uh, those are circumstances where the balance of power absolutely tilts more to an employer who's got tools at, at their disposal that, that workers and even unions just don't. Um, we loved the notice posting rule and surprised that that was controversial given that it's so common in, with EEO law, with uh, workers' compensation, FLSA rights, all of the state notices. I mean, you're all in workplaces where there are big bulletin boards and common areas with postings of what your rights are. Um, and the joint employer regulation is is one we are quite fond of and, and you know, working on the legal defense of it. Um, David, Dr. David Weil, who I know is a, a controversial person, but, you know, wrote about the, the fissured workplace, all of the different ways that work that used to clearly be done in an employer and an employee relationship uh, is, is now being fissured through subcontracting, through misclassification, through joint employment. Um, and it's resulted in the degradation of work, uh, lower wages, less protections, less right to, to um, bargain collectively. Um, and, you know, the, the term economic realities is one we hear a lot in the FLSA context, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a good phrase. You know, when, when there are um, contracted and employed workforces working side by side doing the same work, and some, one group of them has some rights and the other doesn't, and when they're both doing the same work that's dictated by the same employer, 
you know, we, we think that's a joint employer and that's that's somebody that should, they should be able to bargain with. Um, so both in the FLSA as well as the um, NLRA context, uh, we, uh, we believe that the common law definitions and the way the courts have interpreted them over the years are very much consistent with the joint employer regulation from the National Labor Relations Board and the joint employment guidance that was put out in the Obama administration at DOL. Um, turning quickly to DOL, big day yesterday, obviously, with the uh, the new fiduciary reg, with the overtime regulation. Um, and, you know, the overtime regulation is very modest by historical standards. Uh, it, it will um, affect about 3% of employees in this country who will be reclassified as a result of it. For those workers, that's huge. For industry, we think it's something that they can easily absorb. Um, in the 1970s, the overtime regulation covered over 65% of the salaried workforce, and, and this will cover, I believe, less than 33%. Um, so we like the, the two-step process to make sure that workers get a, a raise really quickly. Um, so, you know, just using the, the current methodology of calculating the overtime uh, threshold, we'll, we'll see an adjustment in July, and then we'll, we'll move into a new methodology come January. I'm sure there will be litigation between now and then over that. Um, but also the, the Davis-Bacon regulations really working to modernize that. Again, independent contractor regulations and, and going back to the longstanding Supreme Court articulated test of who's an independent contractor and who's an employee instead of what was done during the Trump administration, where two factors that heavily tilt towards independent contractor were given some degree of primacy. So we, we really see what the Department of Labor is doing with independent contractor as, as going back to the Supreme Court status quo, not doing anything radical and, and certainly not striking at the heart of, of genuine independent contracting in this country. Um, OSHA has, has done some great stuff with the, the new silica rule that's out, the walk around rule. Uh, we certainly would have liked to have seen more progress on protection from heat. Um, and though the emergency temporary standard for COVID is, is long since moot, um, there is so much that OSHA over the past three or four administrations has done around airborne illness. And we really know what we need to do to present, pretend, prevent contamination from airborne illness in workplaces that we would have liked to have seen um, more on that as well. Um, but we'll, we'll see if there are four more years to keep working on those things. So that's a, that's a, a quick summary and then we can delve into some more details. Well, I feel if, if Yoda got to summarize uh, that list of things uh, as presented by you, Judy, I think it would be restoring balance to the force uh, was sort of your perspective on most of these regulations. And so I'm going to ask Tim, uh, our, our DOL specialist with a lot of history there, um, but two things. One, is there anything that you would sort of add to the list of what is most significant? Uh, but then also um, start talking about whether is this a more aggressive approach? Is, is it just restoring balance to the force? Or from your perspective, is this more aggressive than past administrations have been on some of these subjects? Uh, sure, um, I, I won't make any jokes about the dark side or the light side because <laughs> um, everyone, you know, everyone's on the light side, right? Um, uh, a, a couple thoughts on that. Um, maybe just just one, a couple other just quick observations on DOL. Um, one other significant rulemaking in here that um, I don't think we mentioned was the ESG proxy rulemaking that came out of EBSA um, and uh, you know in a in, in an upset um, you know that was upheld at the district court level and that's up at the Fifth Circuit now I believe um, but you know that could have some significant um, ramifications for employee benefit plans um, generally speaking the, the other thing I would say about DOL is interesting is um, it seems in this administration DOL has been part of a um, Whole of government strategy in a couple of different ways, um, and I think consistent with Judy is saying about um, you know rebalancing um, uh, bargaining power between employers and employees, or trying to kind of reset things on a broader economic scale. 
um, it's interesting when you go to DL's website, what you see is stuff about, you know, do you want to join a union, right? And uh, DOL itself doesn't actually do a whole lot with unions. Um, but again, it's part of a broader government strategy. And so when you see um, a series of reforms across DOL, um, you know, an ETA with the National Apprenticeship uh, regulations that they're, they're updating, the walk-around rule, Davis-Bacon, um, uh, several uh, new requirements that have come on government contractors, right? It's, it's all sort of in this direction of collective bargaining, of, of, of moving uh, independent contractor, put that bucket too, you know, moving workers into the employee bucket uh, and, and in this sort of area of, um, you know, collective bargaining, unionization, et cetera, to, to rebalance that power. Um, I, I'm not an economist, so I, I, I don't know what the perfect balance is between, um, you know, worker and employer leverage. Um, but to your second question, Greg, um, I, I, you know, I, I don't think there's anything in, in the playbook this time around that, that has been drastically different from, say, the Obama administration, right, or, or, or the Trump administration just on the mirror side, right? These things tend to flip and flop back and forth. Um, maybe a little bit more aggressive, right, in the sense that, like in the Obama administration, for instance, you have an independent contractor guidance memo, and now you have an outright rule on the books. Um, Though so that may have been influenced by some of the court litigation, um, or or certain executive orders. I'll just give one example. Uh, you know, they updated the minimum wage executive order, and this time did not include certain exceptions that had been in the Obama administration's version. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, I, I don't think there's anything that's um, uh, you know uh, ultra aggressive or surprising beyond what I think we would expect from from uh, from the current administration, um, but maybe dialed up from a you know, one or two notches above where, where the Obama administration was on some of these things. Um, Phil, how about at the NLRB? H has it been, you know, Tim mentioned, and, and Judy also mentioned some examples of things that had existed before, and is this just a restoration of the Obama administration model, or is it sort of an upward spiral, spiral at the NLRB where there's been a more aggressive approach than than past ones. What's your perspective? I, I would say it's both, uh, Greg. And, um, you know, my observations are informed by the fact that I served on the NLRB during the uh, Obama administration. I started, I was appointed to the NLRB, although I'm a Republican, by President Obama. And I served on the NLRB from August of 2013 through December of 2017. And, and so my last year at the NLRB was the very first year of the Trump administration. And for most of that year, the composition of the NLRB was still the same as it was in the Obama administration. And, and, and I was in the minority in a uh, significant number of cases. Uh, the good news both during the Obama administration and the current administration is um, the majority of NLRB decisions, in fact, the overwhelming majority of NLRB decisions uh, are decided unanimously. So much of the NLRB's work involves the day-to-day -day cases and issues that uh, people need to have resolved. Uh, it takes too long to resolve matters that go up through the whole litigation treadmill at the NLRB. But it's true in all administrations, roughly uh, 70 to 75, sometimes as high as 80 percent of the NLRB decisions are unanimous. Uh, on the other hand, the cases that tend to go flip or flop, depending on whether you prefer flip versus flop, uh, they tend <clears throat> to be very important cases. And in those cases, there's a, a long, long history of having divergent views among NLRB members. And so I do think that there are a number of cases that going back at least two decades or so um, have been decided one way uh, when a majority of the board consists of people who, you know, I don't really like to think in terms of uh, political party. Uh, I think that board members tend to try to apply the law in a manner that's consistent with the statute 
but that it also reflects their backgrounds. And uh, in recent years, most board members have either had um, backgrounds that have involved the representation of unions or involved the representation of employers. And, and to the point that uh, Judy raised, which is whether an agency's mission or task should be to equalize power between parties, that's also been a very fundamental difference among people that served at the NLRB. Uh, my, my own view when I was serving at the NLRB and my current view looking at the board is the NLRB is not Congress. So the NLRB applies a law that Congress wrote. And the National Labor Relations Act has not been amended in the past three years. In fact, it hasn't been amended in the last 50 years. And so I think the board's um, responsibility is quite different than trying to actually do create labor law policy that is different depending on who benefits from particular cases. But, you know, my counterparts on the NLRB have felt very differently about, about that issue. And a number of them, I think, uh, you know, have feelings that are aligned with Judy. But I, I do think that the board, to get to the second part of your question, I think that the current board during the Biden administration has gone significantly beyond where prior boards have gone as far as the swing of the pendulum and the range of issues that have been changed. Uh, I mentioned the Semex case that uh, involved the overhaul of the basic rules governing uh, what happens when a union demands recognition, whether union uh, representation can depend on the union prevailing in a secret ballot election. And, um, you know, that's an enormously important issue. It's been addressed two times by the U.S. Supreme Court going back to 1969 and 1974. And, you know, the board didn't let that stand in its way. And the, the one other thing I think that characterizes what we've seen more in the last three years than what we've seen from the board before, uh, the, the, the current NLRB, I think, has been more willing to like put an airplane in the air like the CEMEX standards and then try to build the airplane while it's still flying. And um, I think that that really poses significant challenges for everybody, for unions, for employees, and uh, for employers. So I think the current board has gone beyond what have traditionally been swings of the pendulum, but um, for sure the current board has also um, addressed the range of issues that have tended to go back and forth. Uh, the current board members have been, at least the board majority has been busy at work trying to also undo a number of the changes that were made during the um, uh, the time uh, uh, that uh, John Ring and Republicans were in the majority in the agency. Um, well, Judy, I want to give you a chance to respond to that, um, both from, and, and your answer may be different between the agencies and maybe mm -hmm. even from rulemaking area from rulemaking area, uh, but I'd love to get your perspective is what you have seen the Biden administration do more or less aggressive than the Obama administration's approach? And also, I think our audience would be really interested to hear from sort of a Goldilocks perspective, too much, too little, or just about right from, from your perspective? So I think for both agencies, they have been, the Biden administration has been more aggressive. And there's, there's, maybe not not overwhelmingly so but but noticeably so and i think there's a lot of reasons for that um you know president obama um took office during the, the great recession um there was very little ramp up into it um and and, and then all of a sudden it, it it was you know the campaign and the transition and and we were we were in the thick of it, and it was really sort of an unforeseen crisis, and and really didn't um, start snowballing until late summer. Um, and obviously, President Biden took over during COVID as well, which was another unprecedented crisis, but started earlier in the year. And I think he, in particular, having served as the vice president during the Great Recession, knew how important it was to get like to just hit the ground running. So when 
when Obama came into office, it was first of all all about um, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and then the the word across every agency and across everything in Congress was healthcare, 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 healthcare. Everything else is going to wait. And I understand the decision he made and and why that was the goal. But I think in retrospect, um, there were there were flaws with it, and it meant things were rolled out much more slowly. I, I also think that the Obama administration um, bought into a little bit more the notion that in a, a time of recession and economic crisis, you shouldn't be doing employment and labor regulation all that much. And whereas I believe that's that's actually exactly the time to be fixing things because those crises makes the shortcomings of current reg, the current regulatory scheme and legal scheme so abundant. Clear. So it's 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 the best time to invest in really like rebuilding uh, as as the economy is recovering. So I think that's that's one of the differences. Um, there are also a lot of people in the Biden administration that were you know there as of day one or pre day one who served in the Obama administration too. So they they hit the ground running um, from the outside in. We were working in very coordinated fashion. Um, you know, and NELP is NELP is fully nonpartisan, but obviously the the policies that we support and advocate for are ones we knew the Biden administration was eager to implement. So, um, I think there was there was a lot more hitting the ground running in the first instance. There was um, a starker contrast between the pre like between the Trump administration and the Biden administration than there was between. George W. Bush's administration and, and President Obama's administration. I think those are some of the factors too. And I would also just note, you know, something Tim raised astutely was, you know, the notion that there used to be sub-regulatory guidance about joint employer and independent contractor, and now all of a sudden we're regulating. And and that is because it was the Trump administration that actually put those two issues into interpretive regulations and put them through the notice and comment process for the first time ever. You know, like the overtime regulation in this statute, it specifically says, and the Department of Labor is to define and delimit what it means to be executive administrator or professional employee, right? So there's there's a legislative mandate for the department to regulate. There is no such legislative mandate with independent contractor or joint employer. Both of those are court-created document do doctrines, um, court-explained doctrines, and um, it was the Trump administration that put them through notice and comment in the first instance. So to undo them and redo them, they have to go through notice and comment again, right? So we're sort of in this situation where there are now things that are part of the regulatory agenda that never were before. Uh, and I'm not I'm not saying one way or the other whether it's good or bad, but you know there's a there's a consequence of of a greater regulatory agenda because of decisions made by um, the, the Trump administration's Department of Labor. So I, I do think the Biden administration is, is, is more aggressive. Um, I think he is someone who comes to these issues more naturally and feels them in his gut as, as much as any president, except for perhaps FDR did. And, and we all have to be clear that part of the reason why FDR felt them so deeply was Francis Perkins, who I feel like I need to champion at every turn. Um, one of my professional idols, but I, I do think that um, President Biden has been more aggressive than President Obama. But uh, again, as I think Tim said, I think it's very much within the range of of what would be expected. Uh, the one place I will say, and and I've heard my my friends in the business community say this as well, and and you know, Jennifer Abruzzo is a force of nature and is just moving and shaking in ways that um, you know I'm 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 sure. Everybody would wish that the general counsel of the party that they identify with was as was as forward thinking and aggressive and and um, and ferocious as Jennifer Abruzzo is. And I've, I, I would agree with the, the the characterization of Jennifer Abruzzo as a force of nature. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm sure many of you know Roger King, who is a mutual friend of Phil and mine, and I'm sure others. And uh, I mean, he he's the first to talk about how you know. He doesn't agree with a lot of what she's doing, but admires the the heck out of how she's going about her job. Well, you know, I think that tees up, um, has done a beautiful job of teeing up a really interesting 
policy question, which is, you know, 40 some years ago when Chevron was decided, there was this notion that Congress is going to legislate and then an agency may apply its expertise to figure out the best answer in an area. And then we got into an era, arguably 20, 25 years after that, where there just started becoming presumed Republican and Democrat. I know Phil doesn't like assigning the partisan lines, but just from an outside perspective, whether it's what's actually happening on the inside or not, it looked like there's a Democrat playbook and a Republican playbook. And a Democrat president is going to issue these EOs in the labor and employment area on day one, and a Republican is going to withdraw them on day one and issue this set. And then that seemed to trickle down into the the guidance and even the rulemaking initiatives as well, that there were just these presumed playbooks. And arguably, from some of the things that have been said here, that has escalated so that it's not just a flip-flop in positions, but an attempt to go a step further each time. And, you know, independent contractor, while I was solicitor, uh, I think that there hadn't really been any formal guidance document mm -hmm. uh, or regulation that had addressed independent contractor. And we put out an extremely modest uh, two-page fact statement um, in 2008, I think it was July of 2008, fact sheet 13, that just said, here's the seven factors that courts have looked at didn't have this huge list of examples, but said, here's a few difficult situations we found and issues that may come up in that space. And then you got to the Obama administration and they issued an administrator's interpretation that had a much more comprehensive approach, but it was a guidance document um, out to the agency. The Trump administration withdrew that in 2017 and then issued regulations in 2021. Uh, which were effective for three years. Uh, the Biden administration came in, tried to withdraw them through what a court determined was an insufficient notice and comment process, and then it took them the three years to get a new rule into effect. And so um, my question for all three of you, um, and I'll, I'll turn to Phil first, um, but is this flip-flopping and escalation a, a good thing, a bad thing? Um, or am I imagining that it's happening? Well, I think it's a, a very bad thing. And um, uh, it's hard to know what to do about it mm -hmm. because of, uh, at least in the case of the NLRB, you know, the, the agency exists for the purpose of adjudicating disputes. Just about every NLRB case involves a winner and a loser. Um, and uh, the issues are ones that are often controversial. And um, uh, so I think the, the, the flip-flop issue is very damaging to the agency, and especially the magnitude of the swings of the pendulum to the extent that they um, end up affecting a broader range of issues, which seems to be the case, and also um, involves more extreme positions that don't seem to follow directly from the statute. I think it's bad for the agency. And what used to happen, I've been in this business um, a long time. Uh, what used to happen is the NLRB in certain areas would decide a particular type of case. It would go up to the Court of Appeals, uh, which Congress intended. Congress provided that NLRB uh, decisions, the NLRB is kind of slotted like a federal district court, and its decisions are then reviewed in most cases by the U.S. Courts of Appeals and potentially the Supreme Court. But if a Court of Appeals uh, rejected the board's analysis in a particular case, well, that was a pretty big deal. And in recent years, the agency has adopted a policy of non-acquiescence. And so the board will often just apply NLRB law and continue applying NLRB law, even if one, two, three, or four circuit courts of appeal, sometimes uh, even though the majority of circuits have rejected the NLRB's position, and it doesn't change until an issue gets decided by the Supreme Court. And so if Chevron deference is narrowed or if Chevron deference um, ends up being eliminated, I, I do think one consequence, it'll be incremental, but one consequence will be it'll be quicker to have more uniform law than has existed at least for the past 20 to 25 years since Chevron has been, uh, you know, the, the 
carrying the ball as far as deference is concerned. Um, so NLRB is uh, our, most of our audience probably knows, and as you can tell from this conversation, it's primarily been an adjudicative agency, has occasionally but rarely engaged in actual rulemaking. DOL, on the other hand, functions almost entirely through rulemaking and only has adjudicative authority in a few areas. So, Tim, what, what's your perspective? Judy, Judy points out that independent contractor regulation, that was the Trump administration, uh, which I think you were you were over there at the time. Um, and uh, is that is that an example of an escalation? Is is that a good response to the flip flopping and that it's a more transparent process than just guidance? What's what's your perspective? Sure. Uh, a couple thoughts. One, I, I find the flip flopping more problematic in the adjudicatory context. Right, because you have an agency ostensibly simply applying the law and the best reading of the law. And uh, when that flips, it makes what looks like a quasi judicial process to be more politicized than it should be. Um, flip flopping in a, in a more typical regulatory context, especially where there's one where there's an express grant of regulatory authority, um, I, I, I find that to be less troubling. Right. I, I think there is some room for, uh, uh, you know, not only, you know, raw interpretation of the statute, but also policy preferences in that. And that's baked in a little bit. Um, with the question of the independent contractor rule or other examples, um, you know, I, I think the founding fathers were correct. If you read, you know, the Federalist, right, that wherever there are levers of power, people will pull on levers of power. Right. And so there is over time this sort of regulatory arms race within the agencies as the administrations go back and forth. And there's these questions of, you know, where can the field of battle be extended? Uh, you know, where do we need to retreat and so on? And so using a more powerful regulatory tool, right, going from, um, you know, a sub and, and not to say the sub regulatory guidance doesn't have effect. I, I, you know, I find that it has. You have troubling chilling effects, right? When you just put something on a website or a memo. Um, but the idea of using actual regulation, right, which has more staying power, case in point being the independent contractor rule, right, where um, you know, it had been attempted to be rescinded within the first few months of the current administration and uh, it, it lived on well long after that. Um, and so I think you'll, you'll see agencies um, gravitate towards regulation um, because it is stickier. It has a higher cost. It takes more work to do it, but you also reap rewards from it. Um, with that said, I think that you know actual notice and comment regulation is one of the few things that can ameliorate this issue because you actually have to put all your reasoning out there and subject it to public criticism and public scrutiny. And you know, I saw, I saw from personal experience changes between proposed and final rules because of comments. You know, comments do make a difference, especially, you know, well thought out, well sourced, well, uh, you know, comments that have, uh, you know, good court sites, good data. Because, again, if you don't answer those and answer them correctly and, and properly, then you subject yourself to legal risk in court. So um, with this flip flopping, again, I, I, it will continue to happen, I think. So uh, unless there's, I think, even greater changes to the doctrine than, than the main fisheries case. Um, but there are ways to potentially ameliorate some of its excesses, uh, one of them being to continue to subject more and more of the field to the notice and comment process. Um, so, Judy, what, what's your perspective in both realms, uh, both the adjudicative and the, the regulatory? And uh, are we imagining the flip-flopping? Is it, is it escalating? Is this healthy? Is there anything you would do about it? Yeah, well, first of all, Greg, I think you have tacitly admitted that you started the independent contractor flip-flopping with your two-page letter, so. <laughs> it was the first one. It, could, it couldn't be a flip-flop. <laughs> the, the next time I have to write any sort of uh, professional comments on an independent contractor regulation, I'm going to make you take me out to lunch to to pay me back for it. <laughs> um, look, I, I, I agree that there is more flip-flopping, both adjudicatory with the NLRB and regulatory with both agencies. I think some of it is um, unavoidable, especially in the, the regulatory process. And, and it, it is reflective of the choice the voters make for, for one perspective or another from a president, although of course we know our elections are often very closely decided. Um, I, I 
do agree with Phil, like that it's it's not good for there to be so much flip flop. Like workers want predictability and want to know what their rights are and want to understand what them. Employers need predictability, need to know what their rights are, need to understand it. Right. It's it's one of the reasons why we, for example, have argued so hard for for indexing the overtime um, threshold, for example. Right. So that an employer will know that every three years it's going to go up by about this much, and I can plan for that, and I know it's going to happen instead of waiting. 10 or 15 years for a new regulation, and then all of a sudden there's a huge jump. Um, and, and you know, candidly, I think a, one of the reasons why there's so much flip-flopping is that we have very old statutes, many of which need updating, or many of which never really clearly laid out certain terms, and, and Congress hasn't done its job to legislate more clearly and isn't doesn't seem inclined to anytime soon either um you know phil and i attend this conference every summer where folks from both sides of our labor and employment world get together off the grid uh off the record and there are so many of these issues that we could talk through and figure out if if we could get them onto the floor of congress um but there's so much concern with with winning elections, with keeping your seats, with being a partisan, um, with, you know, representing a particular point of view, even if that might not be the particular point of view of the business community or the worker community any longer, that it's very hard to find champions um, to to bring those things to bear. I, I think if we put the right 20 people in a room together, 10 from each side, if you will, we could probably come up with a really good standard on who's an employee and who's an independent contractor, five or six points that, that are to be considered in a totality of the circumstances fashion and apply across all laws, right? Whether it's taxes, whether it's um, the FLSA, the, the um, NLRBA or Title VII, right? And how much easier would that be for everybody if there was one test for who's an employee and who's an independent contractor and it's across the board but uh, will 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 that ever hit the floor of congress as things become more and more divided and more and more partisan and people seem more and more concerned with throwing bombs rather than actually legislating i i i tend to doubt it so meanwhile we're left with employment means to suffer or permit what the hell does that mean right and we're we're left with executive, administrative, and um, professional, and DOL has to define and delimit. You know, Senator Brown and Representative Takano have a bill out that would set a very clear line threshold, salary threshold, that would really go more in line with where things were in the mid-70s at, at the peak of overtime protection. And and that would, that would eliminate a whole lot of litigation, a whole lot of um, deliberation on the part of employers of who's exempt and who's not. Um, but in the meanwhile, we're, we're arguing over this overtime regulation um, that, that some think is too high, some think is too low, but, you know, really isn't a number that is truly about executives and professionals. So um, I think there's, there's a lot of factors to it. And I think if, if Congress could get its act together and was willing to reach across the aisle and really talk about these issues in a genuine fashion instead of having hearings that are all, you know, calculated political theater, we might be able to find agreement on not all of these issues, but but certainly a lot of them. And, and then just quickly, because you'd mentioned Chevron deference. I mean, look, it, we don't know how the court's going to rule yet. Um, will they completely get rid of it and re-examine everything that ever was decided based on Chevron deference? Or will they retain it as is or some middle ground in between and and you know you've got to think that the chief justice is trying to um find some middle ground to put together a majority however tenuous it may be right and 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 not throw the what i don't know tens of thousands of cases that were decided under chevron back to the federal courts which they are ill-equipped if not unable to you know flatly unable to handle um but you know, at, at at the end of the day, um, I, I think whether there's Chevron deference or not, courts are still going to defer to agencies to some degree or another. It it may not be the same high level of presumption that they get, but you know, a lot of I mean, OSHA's regulations and, and when we're talking about our field, um, 
you know, based on very, very in-depth, complicated scientific information in a lot of cases. And that's not something that the average judge and the average law clerk knows anything about. So I, I think there will there will continue to be some level of deference no matter what the Supreme Court decides with Chevron. Um, and, you know, it, it, it'll it take a while to see where it unfolds. I mean, I, my guess is we'll see some change to, to Chevron deference, but um, I suspect there'll be something, some sort of middle ground that um, the center of the court is going to try to carve out. If I may, the one other thing we haven't talked about in relation to Chevron deference is the possibility that if Chevron deference is eliminated or narrowed, it may produce a moderating effect on the agencies mm -hmm. in their decision because they may have a greater sense that they need to be faithful to the statute that Congress delivered to the agency uh, as, uh, you know, because they may get a smaller amount of deference. And, you know, I, I thought, Judy's thoughtful comments to some degree had a premise that if Congress has not acted in particular areas, well, somebody has to do something. And, you know, that's, again, an, uh, I think a proposition that reasonable minds can differ uh, because, you know, the, the agencies are still stuck with the statute in the form that Congress adopted. And um, uh, anyway, I think the consequences of Chevron deference, it's going to depend on what the Supreme Court does. I, I happened to be at the Supreme Court oral argument yesterday that dealt with uh, what should be the applicable standard governing uh, Section uh, 10J relief in uh, when it's sought by the NLRB. And, you know, what the Supreme, Supreme Court is going to do uh, with respect to deference, I mean, it's it's hard to handicap at this point, but uh, but we'll all find out. And I will say, if anybody in the audience has a question they want to pop into the uh, the Q and A, I'll take a look at that. But uh, but I do have a question that I want to make sure our panelists address. Um, we've we've done all this talking about administrative rulemaking, but we haven't really talked about the APA much. There's been references to notice and comment, but I'd really love uh, Tim to get your perspective initially um, at DOL during the Biden administration. Has the Biden administration been regulating within the bounds of the APA? Have they been engaging in cost-benefit analysis in a way that is faithful and transparent? Um, uh, and have their interpretations of the statute been reasonable, which is uh, if Chevron survives, that was always supposed to be one of the questions. So what's your perspective on how APA rulemaking has, has gone on at DOL? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I would have to kind of go rule by rule on that that sort of a question right grading each one and um i'd also have to read the you know 80 page economic analyses that accompany each of those rules just to give you a full answer on you that mean you haven't Sam? i mean <laughs> depends on the rule stunning <laughs> admission by a practitioner i mean i was you know i'll give you one example i was a little surprised when um you know the davis bacon act rule for instance they said that um you know lowering from 50 percent to 30 percent uh you know to get your uh, prevailing wage um, you know, would have no effect on contractor costs. And I was thinking that was, um, yeah, I wonder how many times they ran that regression to get that result. Um, but generally, I'll, I'll go back to my, my previous theme, right? Um, independent contractors, an example. Uh, the ESG rule is an example where there has been rulemaking, right, which is public and transparent and has notice and comment behind it, where previously it had been sub-regulatory. Um, we didn't really talk about the ESG flip-flop, but that, that's a flip-flop um, all the way back at least to the Clinton administration, where everybody has, you know, switched out the memos back and forth. Um, and so I, I, I did just, do one I, of those flip-flops, Judy. Uh, the 2008 <laughs> Field Advisory Bulletin uh, that uh, expanded on the 1994 guidance on ESG. Anyway, so back that's to your fault too, Greg? Uh, <laughs> Well, it's all my fault is really what it comes down to. <laughs> right. And and it's um it, it's almost the point where it's a little bit comical when you read these preambles, right? Where it's, you know, and then the next one clarified and expanded upon. And then the next one, you know, offered further guidance upon when yeah, I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> what, what what's actually happening? Um so I again just, just back to my previous theme. Um I, I think that it's been a healthy development and uh, I think the Trump administration deserves some credit for it of saying 
let, let's bring some of these issues out of the sub-regulatory realm, right? And, and, and again, I, I advise employers and they pay attention to the memos and the guidance things and the website pages and everything. And they, and I have to tell them like, look, this is, this is probably where they're going. So you better comply whether it's rulemaking or not. Um, and so I think in that extent, um, you know, if, if the stakes have raised in the flip-flopping, but that, it, but that's in terms of the fact that we are now going into real notice and comment rulemaking for more things. I, I think that is a, I think that itself is a positive development because those are the, the mechanisms that are out there under the APA to, uh, to ensure proper, uh, both public and court scrutiny of regulatory action. Well, it, it is slower on the other hand. Judy, what's your perspective on those those trade-offs? Is is the the time it takes to do things that way worth the transparency and feedback that you get from it? Depends on the day you ask me. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> you know, it, all of these things, they're a sword and a shield, right? You, if, if, the the democratic agency is the one that manages to finish up the notice and comment before the congressional review act and sufficiently before a transition to another administration that things can't be undone so easily then it's great but if it's it's an administration that is that has priorities different than the ones no presses then then it's not so great so um I think too, you know, we're not talking about sort of the day to day stuff that the DOL does in the enforcement realm. It's not adjudicatory, but you know, the wage and hour division does so much enforcement work. The um, OSHA does as well, um, and you know, the the time that is spent both by the practitioners in those agencies, but then also the folks in the solicitor's office that are deeply involved in in the regulatory process. Is, is time not spent on enforcement actions, right? To, and, and the money that has to be allocated towards staff writing regulations is money that is not allocated towards enforcement personnel, investigators, or more attorneys in the solicitor's office, right? So as, as important as regulations are, I, I would say more of the meat and potatoes of what NELP focuses on is the day-to-day -day enforcement. Um, and, you know, whether... The independent contractor test is six points that are all sort of considered in the this, the same amount, or it's six points, but two are the most important. Each of those is different, and it certainly tilts the scale in one degree or another. But like, there's just a whole bunch of misclassification out there that we want them to find and remedy, and 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 remedy in a fashion that's that's a prophylactic for for other employers that are misclassifying or think about misclassifying. So um, I, I have a love-hate relationship with the regulatory process. It's it's great to have the the explication that it provides the, the, and, and I agree with what's said about, you know, transparency and locking things in so it's not a back and forth every single time, but but it 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 also then takes away from what is the real meat and potatoes, which is protecting workers. Um, who are in abusive situations, who aren't being paid, who are unsafe, who aren't getting unemployment insurance, who are working in mines where their lives are at danger, you know, all of those things. So, um, like I said, I have a love-hate relationship with the regulatory process, but but I... but agree with the need for, certainly agree with well-reasoned uh, regulations, and it's um, it, it's why we see regulations from from all sorts of administrations some make it and have staying power and others get overturned by the courts because there there isn't sufficient economic analysis there isn't sufficient legal analysis one quick point is um it's important to differentiate how you feel about rulemaking versus how you may feel about what happens to be in a particular rule and um the one other observation I'll make is, it, at least in relation to the NLRB, it's not clear that rulemaking is stickier or takes more time than case adjudication. And uh, I, I did a paper a while back, which I'm in the process of updating, where I looked at uh, a sampling of six or seven major NLRB cases that were adjudicated. And then I looked at the amount of time that was associated with every set of regulations that the NLRB had adopted in its 88-year history. Mm -hmm. And 
it was almost exactly the amount, the same amount of time with respect to, on average, the regulations that the NLRB had actually adopted and the time that uh, major decisions had been pending at the level of the NLRB, which were adjudicated. So it's that that result is one I wouldn't have predicted in advance, but it was almost the same to the day, depending on how much time you assumed was associated in uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking, the proposed rule that comes out initially in connection with most regulations. And, and as what? you noted before, Phil, there's, it's not really, it's an apples and oranges with the DOL since, yeah, except for very small areas, they don't have that adjudicatory. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's fascinating. I'm, I'm going to Google that and read it. Well, we're down to our last five minutes, and we've had a lot of fair and balanced analysis from all of our commentators here, but it's come down to time to actually assign grades uh, to the Biden administration, such as you see fit to administer. So, um, Tim, do you want to start with DOL? Uh, sure. I was hoping Judy would go first because if you know, if she gives something an A, I'd probably give an F. If she gives a B, I'll give a D. Uh, and so <laughs> Um, uh, you know, overall, I'll, I'll give um, I'll give it a D for for the Department of Labor. Um, but by sub agency, um, you know, wage and hour has been very very aggressive. Um, again, you know, I credit them for the rulemaking, but distinguishing what's in the rule versus the fact that you did use a rule to do it. Uh, independent contractor, I think, just reinjects uncertainty, et cetera. Um, uh, um, you know, various uh, executive orders that come through wage and hour regulating government contractors. Again, I think well outside bounds of statutory authority. Uh, so wage and hour doesn't do very well. Uh, OSHA's COVID rule was um, extraordinarily aggressive, uh, and 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 uh, we saw what happened to that at the Supreme Court. Um, not a fan of the walk around rule either. Uh, and then um, for EPSA, um, I have to give it F for fiduciary. Um, <laughs> So I'll, I'll give them, uh, you know, h higher marks in terms of process and execution. Um, but when it comes to, from my perspective, uh, in terms of, of of having, you know, certainty for employers, ensuring that the economy as a whole is running well, um, D D for D O L. So. All right. Well, you said you wish Judy had gone first. I'll let Phil back clean up. And so I'll put Judy uh, in the middle since she's spanning both agencies. Uh, let's see if she just assigns the opposite grades to everything Tim just said. Yeah, I, I think for DOL as a whole, I'm going to give them a B plus. Um, I would have loved to have seen some things happen much sooner than they did, but you couldn't have. And I think if Secretary Walsh hadn't left, probably things would have been done sooner. But you know, having to let that on that whole political process take place certainly slowed things down. So uh, a B plus for not getting things done as quickly as I would have liked. Um, and, and I think some things could have been a little more fulsome, if you will. But, uh, you know, overall, very happy. And I think that the, the Biden Department of Labor has done very good work. And again, not just in the regulatory agenda, but really restoring a lot of vitality to enforcement. Um, and, and they've had particular challenges with all of the child labor stuff that they've had to take on in, in the last year, which is very costly and labor intensive. Um, the board, you know, I'll give I'll give the board a good solid B plus A minus too. I, I do think, you know, again, General Counsel Abruzzo is uh, is very aggressive and focused and um, and exceptional. Um, and I think the the board itself too, under Chair McFerrin's leadership has has done a great job. Um, again, you know, Part of it is waiting for majorities to to coalesce, so that that takes a little bit of time too. And you know, I'm I, I think like most advocates, I'm never I'm never happy. I always want more, so I'll I'll, I'll stay in sort of like the B plus A minus range. Um, Phil, NLRB's grades. You know, as I said before, I I have a lens that looks at regulatory process. This is uh, my chaos versus clarity index, and then the policy judgment. Uh, assessment, which is how much do does the agency kind of think the way I do? And I, I think that's less important. I didn't even regard that as important when I was serving as a board member. And many of my colleagues in a narrow band of cases didn't agree with me. But I'm going to say on both measures, I think the current NLRB is uh, needs improvement. Um, 
And on the regulatory process side, uh, you know, the current NLRB has really had an affection for standards that are unclear or case-by-case -case adjudication or rebuttable presumptions that I think are very, very difficult for real people to understand and apply. Uh, joint employer and independent contractor, for example, anytime that you are an agency charged with regulating employment and you ask the question, who is your employer and who is an employee and people don't know the answer, then everyone's in trouble. And that's really the situation where um, I think parties are with respect to that issue. Um, uh, the one other thing, every in every administration, the NLRB has been needs improvement in terms of speed of decision making. And I think the time is overdue for the NLRB to start thinking about how they can decide cases quicker. I used to say that parties cannot afford to win a case before the NLRB. And it's not because people are doing something wrong, but the process really needs to change. And I think it would be helpful for the NLRB to think out of the box on how cases can be decided with shorter opinions, quicker opinions. And some of that is hardwired in the in the statute, but not all of it. And um, uh, on the policy judgment grade, the only thing I'll mention specifically is uh, the force of nature. Um, uh, my former colleague, Jennifer Abruzzo, uh, who is a very, very gifted manager and administrator and very popular in the agency, um, uh, the one thing that I have strongly disagreed with in terms of how I think is the um, position that employer workplace discussions are inherently unlawful or per se coercive. Um, I may have had that reversed. I think it's per se unlawful and inherently coercive. I just don't think that is a sustainable position based on uh, the specific language that's in the act that affirmatively protects speech including speech by employers, the legislative history underlying the act, the First Amendment, uh, lots and lots of pronouncements about employer free speech made by the Supreme Court and the courts of appeals. Um, so that's just one area, but uh, obviously the current board has decided important cases in many areas that I think uh, many people that think like I do, uh, you know, would, would find that it's difficult to reconcile the board's position in these cases with what uh, the, with the statute that Congress adopted. Well, uh, I want to thank the whole panel uh, for their great remarks. I think our audience can take away Congress is fundamentally broken. The agencies have been picking up the ball and running with it, and there are divergent views on how well they've been doing at that. Um, and it's all your fault, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> all of it. Uh, Steve, do you have any concluding remarks? Yeah, first of all, I just want to thank uh, this fantastic panel for for sharing their points of view. And I wanted to thank the audience for tuning into this program. For more content like this on the regulatory state and the American way of life, please visit us at regproject.org. That's regproject.org. Thank you. Thank you.